Hello, there we go. And welcome to our final day of uh, Durangler's Fly Fish, I shouldn't say final day, final nightly feed of Durangler's Fly Fishing Festival. Um, tonight we are going live with Matt Bennett, who is a great friend of our shop, and he is a great fly tire. And we're looking forward to having him on today. So, just as a reminder, we got some uh, giveaways, so you can sign up in the links in the video description here. And we got some new stuff to give away. We got some Loon, uh, Loon gear, some UV stuff, UV, UV Cure, um, Loon tools, and then we also got a pretty cool selection of Montana Fly boxes as well. So uh, sign up down there, and then we're gonna cut that drawing sign up off tomorrow at 2 p.m. our time. And so you'll have time during our Euro Nymphing presentation, which I will be doing and Rob will be filming and he will probably be clowning on me as we do it, but hopefully it'll help you guys all learn something if you're interested in beginning fly tying. And then the drawing is at three. Um, so without further ado, let's bring on Matt Bennett and Rob is here as well. And welcome Matt. Hey guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's, you guys want to just tie supplies? Let's tie flies. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. cool. Uh, so I'm, I got the video up so I can kind of keep track of uh, people asking questions and things like that too. Uh, so uh, without any further ado, we're going to do the, the lunch money first. And uh, yeah. that's this, this guy here. Um, so kind of your bite size streamer uh, for fishing just about anywhere. Um, so I just get started. So this is on a size two uh, Eric's hook, NS122, I think it's their uh, streamer hook. Um, I'm gonna so I'm just gonna, I'll I'm go gonna, ahead. I'm gonna comment on that fly saying, I've caught fish on this fly, um, geez, in Lemon, on the San Juan, on the Animus. Um, the Rainbow, the Brunch Money is one of my favorites too, but geez, you can catch so much. And it was a bass yeah. fly, right? Bass, bass, pike. I've caught a lot of fish on that thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a good kind of multi-species fly. You know, I, I fish them a lot down here for bass, but I'm also going to, uh, you know, every time I come up fishing by you guys, I always have a box full of these and a bunch of different colors. This tan one's probably the one I fish the most of. Um, so I started with uh, just a bump of thread here uh, to tie the eyes on. These are medium uh, hairline double pupil eyes. Uh, so I get those kind of on there and relay a thread base back. Uh, the important thing with this fly is just to make sure that there's a consistent stop point. So I usually stop and start the tail like right at the barb or right between the barb and the point of the hook. Um, and this is gonna ride hook up in the water. So we're going to invert that and then keep going here. So I've got some rabbit zonkers. Uh, so the zonker itself is, uh, this is a hairline groovy bunny. Uh, it's just a black bar groovy bunny. It's like tie dyed. Uh, so you have like white and tan and uh, yellow kind of all in there at the same time. Um, so what I'm going to do is measure the skin side here. Um, and I want that to be just a hair longer than the shank of the hook, maybe a shank and a quarter length, something like that. So I'm going to kind of hold it at that point with this finger and kind of pop the hook point through their skin side first, like so. Move that down after we take it out of the vise. And then we'll tie this down here. So I have my special little, little party trick for that. Let's see if I can do it without hitting my camera. If I hit my camera, we may be out of <laughs> luck, but we're just gonna spin our bobbin around like so uh to tighten that down and it's just a time saving thing that i do since i'm tying you know a lot of these every day uh every every little bit of time that i can do to uh to save time is is helpful so we got that going uh we're going to take this front facing piece here and wrap that for the collar 
So usually I'll do two or three wraps and we're kind of wrapping this skin side down, uh, kind of stroking these fibers back as we wrap it up. And that just forms kind of our transition collar. And if you're feeling fancy, you can do that little trick again to kind of tie that off real quick and then cut your skin side of the rabbit there. We got a question. What vice are you using? Uh, I have a Renzetti Master. Uh, that's what I tie on mostly. I've been tying on it for about a year and a half. Uh, it's a great vice. It's held up well. I put probably, I've put close to 15,000 flies on it in the past year and a half or so. Uh, so it's, uh, it doesn't owe me anything at this point, but it's, uh, it's still working hard and I haven't had any issues with it. So, um, you know, if you are getting started out tying or you're looking for a, a new vice, hard for us to go to get anything better than Renzetti, but there are, you know, other good companies out there like, uh, Dyna King and, uh, Regal, all of them kind of have their advantages and disadvantages, but I just prefer the Renzetti for what I do. And you said that what, that's the A-Rex hook again. Yeah, it's the NS122. It's like their version of the B10S. So okay. uh, this is a size two. So it's about the biggest one I do because the next size up of a B10S is, a, is the one in the hook gauge and the one almost doubles. So it's hard to invert it at that point uh, without using way too much weight. Oh. So tie in some legs here, uh, kind of at the midpoint, just for some added motion. Um so I'm going to tie them on the side close to you guys where you can see that. So right in the middle, kind of set those right on top of the eyes. And I'll just pinch that down, get a few wraps. And then in this piece that's facing forward here, we'll take it and pull it over the other side and wrap back on that. And now these are tied in pretty secure. I prefer to do them this way because then you don't get a fish come in. And just if you tied them in, you know, right in the middle with one leg on each side, they can still pull out. So uh, I prefer to do it this way just for durability's sake. And then we'll just kind of pull these legs back and cut them to be just a little bit shorter than the uh, zonker tail. Have you had anyone fish this for like redfish or snook oh, yeah. or anything? Yeah, I tie a lot of these. This color actually works really well. It's kind of a like a Texas brown shrimp color, but you can do it... Um, you can do it. I like pink and white for the coast. It works really well. You can tie them um, in an olive. I mean, wherever you want to fish them, they work really well just to kind of match your match whatever forage you're trying to imitate. So like tan and white's a pretty good shrimp color. Um, you could tie them to imitate like some mullet or some piggy perch or something like that for redfish. And um, yeah, they, they, they work really well for redfish down the coast. You know, pretty much everything eats bait fish. Sure. Yeah, black and purple. Do you change too. the hook at all for that, or same hook? Same hook. That's why I like the Arix version because it's it has a little bit better coating on it than the Gamma uh, equivalent of the same hook, um, and it has the the um, what's the word I'm looking for? The gauge of the hook is just a touch heavier than your standard B10S. Yeah. Um, so I I tend to tie these on there, but the, a regular B10S is still a great hook, and you it'll stand up in the salt just fine. Have you um, tied or tried any? And I oh, I don't know, so I'm not I don't have the answer. Have you tried any of the what is it the fulling mill streamer stripper? It's a similar like setup, and they claim it's saltwater safe. I have it. Uh, I have it tied on those. I don't uh, I don't have access to them, but I've heard good things about the hooks. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I, I tell everybody this, you know, fly tying is a lot like cooking, like don't get stuck on the same exact recipe that you're seeing, like kind of put your own spin on it, you know, change the hooks, change the weights, change the, the colors and, uh, you know, put, put your own little spin on it. Yeah. And we have a question, Dr. Max Voigt says the inversion uh, water inverted, I guess, inverted water movement is dependent on the weighted eyes being on top of the hook. Yeah. So you yeah. need, in order for it to ride hook up, you need to put the weight of the fly, which is the eyes in this case, on the top of the hook shank. If you put them on the bottom of the hook shank, all your weight's going to be on the bottom and it's still going to ride hook down. Uh, so like the mo most popular fly that people are probably familiar with in this term is like a clouser minnow. Like the eyes are just tied on the bottom of the hook um, to help invert that hook in the water. So you have uh, a lot more snag resistance this way. Uh, so we're going to build the head of the fly out of uh, Jacenio's laser dub. Um, so we're going to use some tan. I got some tan, some white, and uh, kind of this uh, rusty bronze color uh, like that. 
So what I'll do, most people will have trouble with this because I use way too much dubbing. Um, you don't need a whole lot. Uh, so what I'm going to do here, I have kind of a pinch of this stuff now. I'm going to take it and just straighten out these fibers, kind of make them all similar length. I'm, I'm pulling out these longer fibers, but also kind of tearing this material a little bit to get it a pretty similar type bundle. And then at the end, I'll just kind of pull out these longer pieces like so. So yeah, I have kind of a, a, a selection like that. I'm going to take it and kind of divide it in half. So I have two pieces now. Where's my camera? There it is. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to make a, a V with those. And then I'm going to stick the head of the fly into that V, kind of hold it loosely shut with my left hand. And then with just a couple pin traps, real soft pin traps, just wrap over it like that. And then stroke all those back, kind of hold them tight and make a little bit of a thread dam in front of it like so. And that's your, your first just collar. We're just trying to start forming that kind of bait fish shape. Uh, so now we're going to do two colors. So I'm going to do some tan on the top of the fly and the, some white on the bottom. So again, just grabbing this kind of similar amount, straightening out those fibers, put the tan on top, kind of tying it at the midpoint. If you haven't used this stuff, it's really awesome. It's just like an acrylic dubbing um, that is very translucent in the water. It looks very much like an actual bait fish once you get it in the water. Um, has a little bit of sparkle kind of built into it too. We're gonna pull all that back. Again, wrap our thread in front of that. Then we're gonna add, I like uh, on this color especially, just to add a little bit of a kind of a gill accent. So that's what we're gonna do with this rusty bronze color. So I'm just gonna take just a little bit of it and kind of twist it to make like a little cord, kind of like that. And set that on the side. Again, just like with the legs, right at the midpoint, kind of pinch that in there right above the eyes, pull the other piece to the other side and wrap back over it like that. And then we're going to move our thread kind of all the way up to the hook eye. And then we're just going to do that previous step again, once more, where we're just using tan and white. And at this point, you should be able to see if you've got way too much material or not and can start pulling some of this stuff out. And uh, what was the dubbing again? We had a question. Someone missed it. It's um, the uh, Senyo's laser dub. Stuff yep. right here. Yep, and we have that at Dranglers too for anyone who's interested. Uh, we don't have every color of it, but we have quite a few. So, and we're tying this bunch in, try and keep it right on the uh, top of the fly here, right at the eye of the hook. Just leave yourself a little bit of room as needed to be able to finish that off. And then another little bunch for the bottom in white, same way. Sorry, I had to run and grab a kid. Um, did you answer Buck's question, Rob? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we got it. Cool. You're going to pull all this back, pull it kind of tight to kind of expose that hook eye, um, and then just sneak your thread in there as best you can. And give it a couple whiff finishes. Mine slipped off there, so I'm going to do another one. And then anytime I have exposed thread on a fly like this i'm going to come in with some uv resin uh some loom stuff or whatever you have even regular head cement works too but you gotta wait for it to dry just hit it with the light uh what scissors am i using uh so i use pretty much all of dr slick stuff uh these are the dr slick razor scissors um, that's what I use for pretty much 90% of my time. It takes it, you know, it takes a little while to get used to just holding them um, in your hand and you got to make sure you pick up a pair that, you know, if you, I have pretty big fingers and they just kind of, my thumb just barely fits through that loop there. Um, so maybe uh, swinging by a fly shop, they'll let you test drive some and make sure your fingers actually fit through there. Uh, but I have that trouble with some smaller uh, ones myself there's some there's some that I really like out of Europe that my fingers just won't even fit through uh, so I have to I have to stick with these Dr. Slick ones but they're great too uh, so we got some 
resin on there. We're going to come in with a marker now, and this is just where I add a little bit more character to the flies. So I'm going to pull this dubbing fairly tight and just add a set of three bars. This is a Prismacolor dark brown marker. Like that. Set of three bars. I'm going to come in. If you've looked at uh, Charlie Craven's Gonga Fly, this is a similar coloration. It's actually where I got the idea from for this color. Um, for his, uh, I think it's like a tan and yellow Gonga. He does this similar kind of barring on. And then we're going to add like a little bit of throat color to the bottom. So I come in with my marker, just add a little bit of yellow there. Coming back in with some orange and just a touch of orange. And... The most important thing you do to this fly is to brush it after you've finished all that. So what this brushing does is it helps those colors um, kind of blend in with each other. It fades that barring a little bit so it's not as distinct. Um, so if you wanted a little bit more solid barring, you would brush it first and then add the barring at the end, which I do on some colors. That's it. That's your basic tan and white lunch money. Is that just a gun cleaning uh, brush? Two. Uh, so the, yeah, it's like a brass front gun cleaning brush. So this works like a uh, hairline makes like a, a nylon dubbing brush that works. Yeah. Um, a really old toothbrush will work. Um, you know, just uh, use what you got. Uh, so I tie this in a lot of colors. I'll show you. I got some of the other colors here that I can show you. So this is just your standard. Like I do, I kind of divide them up into like more like realistic versus impressionistic colors. So I'll show you a couple, couple examples of each. Um, I got a bunch sitting over here. So there's your kind of tan and white, uh, which is a great, this is usually the first color that I, I'll reach for in fish. Um, you have your fire tiger more conventional kind of lure scheme uh great for kind of off color water um shows up really well if you fish anywhere with like water that gets stained uh so like you know when i would fish in like east texas or louisiana we have a bunch of pine trees and those needles will kind of stain that water and you'll get that kind of tannic color mm -hmm. it's like iced tea uh, this kind of color will show up really well in that uh this is just a regular kind of shad color uh that i fish um I blend a bunch of different colors of, of laser dub to kind of get that. So it looks a lot, it looks pretty white and it is, but the tops are a bunch of different kind of blended colors. That's sweet. Um, got your bluegill, sunfishy color, um, especially this time of year in, in Texas when the bass start spawning, uh, they get super aggressive towards sunfish. So having something that color and then again, you know, kind of going back to your conventional lure schemes, this is kind of your sexy shad color. So blue and yellow and white, um, good kind of all around attractor color. I go, I grow more and more into fishing like these mostly kind of white colors with a little pop of color. I just, they fish really well for me. So that's what I fish a lot of is this type of stuff. Um, and then let's see, I got like an olive and yellow. You guys, do you guys have yellow perch up there? I feel like I yeah. caught some in a lake somewhere up there. We yeah, do. Pewet and uh, Totten and all those. I feel like Jackson lakes. Lake by my place yep. has, yeah, has some in there too. Uh, yep. This is kind of your your perchy color, your your olive over yellow with a little bit of barring. Um, yeah, that color scheme's done really well for me in those lakes. Uh, with the, that's that's our main forage base, and most of those smaller lakes for those pike and bass yeah. yellow perch. That's awesome. I, um, I remember catching some up there yeah. before. Those that white and tan one you tied uh, is that kind of supposed to be like your golden shiner? Kind of. You color? know, I don't. I don't even know what I was thinking when I kind of came up with that color. I just like the way it stood out. Um, you know, our main forage here is shad, and we have some uh, black tail shiners. We have golden shiners, mm -hmm. but they're more in the muddier water. We have a bunch of different bait fish that kind of. This color, once you get it under the water, kind of just turns mostly white with a little bit of darker color on top. So I guess it's kind of a kind of an all around thing. Um, yeah, I could definitely imitate a golden shiner for for sure. Yeah. Any questions about this guy? I'm gonna start. I'm gonna pack some of this stuff up real I've, quick uh, and we'll get rolling. So that your nice brown thing. trout color and rainbow trout color on that oh. done well too on. Yeah. Really well so, here. Uh, 
one of the best days I've had on the Dolores was on the on the brown trout color, uh, fishing up closer closer to the dam near the top. Um, had some really good days in some of those shaded pools fishing uh, fishing streamers. You know, that, that river is notoriously tough because the flows are so low and the fish, you know, get out their magnifying glasses for every mayfly that you throw out there. So <laughs> sometimes just throwing a big streamer and getting them mad is, uh, has been That'll the ticket it. for me. And then, you know, half the time you'll throw something like that and all the fish will run away from it too. So <laughs> you have pick your battles, I guess. Um, you know, if you see that happen in switch or, uh, you know, I've still caught some of the bigger fish in the pool doing it that way for sure. Uh, so we'll move on and I'll do, uh, I'll do my craft for bait fish next. I'm going to do this on a four aught. So, uh, approaching pikey size for you guys, um, do this in kind of a rainbow trout color. Let's swap a couple things around real quick. Try not to knock over my camera. So I don't have an example of this one already tied up, uh, but most of this is going to be built out of craft fur. We're going to tie in a little bit of a foul guard first, uh, just to help keep the fly from fouling when you fish it. I just tie that out of uh, like SF blend, or you can use EP fiber or something like that. Just any kind of like crinkled synthetic fiber like that. Um, I use mono thread on this fly. Um, I find that it bites into that craft fur pretty good and keeps stuff from slipping. So I'm just using some regular mono and we're going to tie in a hank a full hank of this kind of sf blend stuff do that kind of pull that stuff back and then this is where i'm going to tie in my flash so i like i really like blending colors on a lot of my flies so i'm going to take a couple different strands of flash and a few different colors and again, you can adjust, you know, adjust the flash based off what you want to fish. So uh, I got some pearl I'm going to do in there. It's just kind of a lateral scale mix. Tie that in. Got a little bit of silver. This is, uh, I forget what this stuff's called. It's like Firefly or something like that. It's a little bit different. Throw a few strands of that in there. And I always double over my materials like this when I tie them in again, just like those legs, just for durability. Pop that in. And then this is just some holographic flash of blue blend. Uh, I think this is called like hollow sunset or something like that. It's got some pinks and purples and, and golds on it. This is a fly I'll fish a lot for bass here. Um, and I'll usually tie them fairly flashy. And if I get out on a day where flash just isn't really the the name of the game that day, I'll just start cutting it out. Um, so I usually have a pair of scissors in my box for that. So there's our flash, there's our tail. Um, I'm gonna tie in one more strand or one more hank of this SF blend here. And that just helps keep everything back where it should be. Um, so anytime you're doing tying with these types of materials and doing kind of this style, that's kind of hollow tying. Um, I use like a little tool. This is just like a wooden tool uh, a friend made for me um, that has a hole in it. You can just use that and pop it back. The cheapest way to do this is to get like a get like a crappy big pen or something and take the insides out of it and just have your plastic pen that you can use to help fold all that material back. I have done so that. There's our tail. Yeah, and it's it makes it super easy. You can use like a straw. Um, you know, they make... So like everything else in fly tying, they make some pretty like uh, fancy and expensive tools that you don't necessarily have <laughs> to have. Yeah, Loon's got a new one out that we have that's pretty nice. It's pretty big and you can actually hold on to it. Oh, yeah, I've seen that actually. Yeah, that would work super well. Um, so I'm going to take this and kind of trim this up now. And again, you can leave this as long or short as you want. I just kind of come in and tie some of this and taper it down. Um just tapering into a, a little bit of a point. We're going to come in and kind of do a final trim on it anyway. So you have to get crazy with it right now. Let's start my thread back. Usually I'll do, when I do these, I'll do them in batches to where I do, do all the tails first and then I'll come back in and uh, do the rest of it. So anytime I do like a wet finish and start it again, I'm going to add 
either some super glue or some uv resin and just cure that up just to you know, spend all this time on a fly you want to make sure it doesn't fall apart on the first cast have you Not that i've ever had that happen has anyone commissioned these for salt water for you oh yeah for sure this is definitely a salt water pattern i mean you know i most of my patterns i consider them fairly versatile mm -hmm. um so I'm, you know, I don't have a whole lot of time to tie for me. So when I do, I want a pattern that I can grab and go fish in the salt or in fresh water or for, you know, predator fish or whatever. So sure. um, this is definitely one of those. Um, so for the salt, I'll tie it in like mullet. I've tied some mackerel colors and send to people. Um, had a guy catch a tuna on one, which is cool. Uh, you know, a bunch of other stuff tied, you know, tied different versions of this that I've sent to people going to Amazon for peacocks and some really big ones to a guy who went tame and fishing and caught like a ridiculously huge tame on one. And, uh, that's awesome. I guess I think he was in Kamchatka or something. Uh, so pretty cool. Uh, it's a bunch of crap for now. Um, I prefer the hairline stuff. Uh, it's usually the longest. Um, I would just tell you to go buy it from an actual fly shop. It's usually the best quality stuff. The stuff you'll find at Hobby Lobby or whatever is fine for small flies, but you know, you start getting into the into the bigger the bigger sizes like these, and it's just not going to be near long enough. Yeah. Um, what thread are you using? I don't know if you said that already. Uh, this is a mono thread. Uh, so it's just like mono, I forget what denier, or what, uh, thickness it is. It's like, uh, yeah, one tenth of an inch, yeah. uh, thickness. So what I'm doing here is to make this craft fur easy to work with. I'm actually cutting these into little squares. Um, that helps me be consistent when I grab these each time, uh, when I grab, so I can grab the same amount of material every time that I go to use these. So I'm just cutting some little squares out of this stuff. We learned a pretty wild uh, craft fur trick from Alex Gerbeck from Umqua a couple of weeks ago. Oh yeah, where he's you wanna you yeah. Wanna share? yeah he's yeah. Uh, it was pretty awesome. He cuts maybe I'll grab some and show the camera later on. Um, he cuts like a strip of it, and how thick was that mm -hmm. on the hide? I guess mm -hmm. I don't know, like a fourth of an inch, maybe maybe a quarter of inch. Yeah. And just like three, four it inches all of going it. Like one way, you know, so like yeah. if it was all folded back, you would cut it along that length uh, with it going across one direction. And then you stretch it, like pull it. Uh -huh. right? So it'll start. And then, yeah. you, and it turns it into a quick craft brush. And you make a craft brush. <laughs> oh, that's a cool idea. It was that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. You know, just like a simple, it's like the kind of like almost like those, you know, like wire free. Fox yeah, fox. yeah, yeah, yeah. The hairline Real. does. Synthetic. I like those. It's exact. It's almost exactly that. It was pretty. That's sweet. a good idea. Yeah. Uh, so I see somebody's asking where do I live and where I'm fishing. So I live actually in Austin, uh, in Texas, but I we have a place uh, just west of Durango that I've been coming up and fishing a long time uh, in Colorado. So I kind of split some time between here and there, usually every year. Um, so I'm usually fishing for bass and sunfish and things like that down here. We have some trout too. Uh, it's just not my favorite style of trout fishing. It's a lot of, a lot of bobber watching, uh, which is not my favorite thing to do, uh, <laughs> but I can go down and usually catch a bunch of fish on streamers too. So I'll go do that sometimes. I was already tied this one section in, but I'm going to do another section where you can see what I was doing. So we're doing what's called hollow tying for this, where the material is facing out the front of the hook. We tie that in just kind of loosely to spin it around and then push it back and tie over it like that. And that basically helps us build bulk with this fly without adding too much weight. Um, so I'm going to do that just a couple more times here and I'll show you kind of how that, how that works cut out i got a square gray i'm going to use i need a little bit more white yeah and i know you using the mono thread and it's something i've started doing you know more recently and i think for bait fish and saltwater flies it's a uh, key that a lot of people don't take advantage of uh yeah. just doesn't really change the color of the fly and bites no, it doesn't. it's nice it's nice to use on stuff like this and also nice for building durability on the fly. When you when you hit this stuff with like Zappa Gap or liquid super glue, it, it really like melts it basically to the fly. You're not going to have very many durability yeah. issues because of that. 
So every bunch that I tie in, I go about halfway up the shank. You want to keep the tail fairly sparse where you get some movement from it and build denser and denser as you get to the front to help kind of push water. So I'm about halfway, I'm about three quarters of the way up the entire shank now, or maybe two thirds and tie this next bunch of white in. You can see, I kind of pressed it down over the hook shank where the hook shank's in the middle and just kind of some loose wraps to help spin that around. And then you can kind of tease it back or, uh, I don't know where I threw my material. My, uh, it was literally right here. It's probably sitting right in front of me. Um, to help push all that material back like so. You need your pen. Yeah, I need my, I got a pen. I got like 14 hollow tools around here somewhere. <laughs> they're just hidden by cameras and lights at this point. Um, so you can see now that bait fish shape kind of taking, taking, uh, taking shape here. And this fly looks really big, but it's really not that hard to cast. Like you can throw this on a six weight pretty easily. Brian, our, Brian. our shop staff this for him this summer good dude asks what's your favorite stream to fish in durango in durango i don't like fishing anywhere in durango if i don't have to uh, okay how about animus, four corners area the animus has not treated me well over the years uh it's tough man you know i've had i've had i caught my very first unguided trout on the animus and then i promptly set the hook into my or hooked myself in the finger my dad had to come pick me up and then had to take me to the parking lot of albertson's to be able to pull the hook out and like band-aid it up and stuff it was like you know it was before we really fished a lot of barbless stuff and then, you know i was a teenager and had like that like midge dropper just sunk in my thumb up to the bend and i was like i don't i don't know what to do with this uh <laughs> So, Dad, if you're watching, thanks for uh, performing minor surgery in the Albertsons parking lot. Uh, so, to answer your question, actually, uh, I like fishing a lot of stuff in the Durango area. Um, the one that I will mention by name that I, I – there's plenty that I won't mention by name that I'm sure you guys know about. Um, but I like, I like fishing the, the lower Dolores a lot. Um, I've had the best and worst days of my fly fishing career on that river. Um, and every time I go there, I learn something different. And that's, that's what, uh, that's where I go to kind of unwind and fish every time I come up there. Um, I fished the upper Dolores around Rico a couple of times too. Um, and actually I caught a couple of cutthroat up there last time I was up there, which was pretty cool. I never, I haven't seen that many up there before, but it's cool sweet. to catch some. Um, and then, you know, I fish a lot of the like mountain streams up um you know anywhere between like mancus and pagosi springs uh and even further into like south fork i've had a lot of those little mountain creeks in the the upper san juan and um you know a lot of different places up through there so i like i like being on places that i won't necessarily run into anybody else um so i can have it all to myself um and there's plenty of spots you know just Honestly, if you're looking for spots to fish up there, just buy buy a forest service map, pick a spot, and go check it out. Like that's that's kind of how I started doing it. Yep. If it's got water in it year round, it's probably got fish in it. Yeah, and it you know it may just be like some brookies or something or some small cuts, but you'll have a good time. Um, yeah. And you won't necessarily run into anybody either. All right, so there's our there's our gray and white um so now we're going to add a bunch of flash to the head of this that's kind of how i help do the bulk and i'm using this ripple ice fiber for this stuff because it has some some waviness to it um helps build a little bit of bulk so i got some uh, olive there i throw a little this is going to look super flashy uh, but by the, by the time you're done with it, it the rest of the crafter kind of covers that up so I'm going to tie this in kind of right at the midpoint, just some olive and some silver together. Right Rob has argued, not argued, but stated that, you know, your thoughts on this. He doesn't love ripple ice fiber sometimes because it comes all bent and crinkly. Like that's, not, that's exactly what I want for this fly, though, because it's helping me build bulk underneath okay. for doing the next uh craft for a tie in okay uh so it's not the greatest flash for every situation but i think it definitely has some use 
Um, so, it's not what I'm going to reach for if I want some flash for like a trout streamer usually just because I don't like the way it looks. I'd rather use like, you know, flash of or something that's going to at least add a little bit of movement too. But for building bulk and adding some underneath flash, I think this stuff works pretty well. And yeah. Yeah, it's great. They're, uh, I think it's EP who makes this stuff called Thunderstruck. And it's oh, like, I haven't seen that. It's like identical, but he sh ships it straightened out. So it's not like crushed uh, in a package. Yeah. It's, I think oh, it's yeah, the same the packaging, thing. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. The packaging on this, some of this stuff sometimes yeah, leaves a little like, to be desired. Yeah, if you if you cover it up with another material, it's it's great. I like I like the material. I like how flashy it is. You know, it's not super flashy. You know, like some things are. Uh, for bait fish, it's awesome because it looks like scales. But if mm -hmm. you're trying to tie like something that's like a really specific shape, it just it's like all over the place. Yeah, like yeah, it's hard to get it to hold its structure very well, just on its own. So this is what I'm gonna tie on the side, just as kind of an accent. Uh, so this is just a mix of a couple different pinks um that i mixed up together and i i actually tore these in half um just so i didn't have too much length because i just kind of want that cheek color um if you look at if you look at rainbows they don't get a whole lot of like a real deep red or anything like that until they're or usually till they're a bigger fish so i just add a little kind of hints of it especially when they're fly. fresh off the stalker truck yep fresh off the stalker truck which is what we're going for here we want to imitate the stalker truck as it pulls up to the lake and starts yeah. dumping fish in when they stock via cedo that's when you want to fish that's this exactly what i was thinking <laughs> of yeah they're waiting they know when that they got the schedule they looked at the internet they know when that truck's going to be there yeah they're not so edible when they get that dark stripe down on there a little too big yeah so we're going to finish it off. I'm going to do some some olive over the top here um, and then do some white on the bottom. Uh, we're going to tie it in facing the wrong way. I just realized that I need my long whip finisher. Hopefully it's within grabbing distance. Yep, there it is. Ooh, here's a good question from Brian. Uh -huh. um, at what age did you start tying and how do you not get burnout having to tie so many flies every day? Uh, answer your second question first in that it's a, a mortgage is very expensive. It takes a <laughs> lot of flies to pay for. So that, that keeps me going pretty well. Um, but you know, it, I, you know, it's like any other job you do get burnout sometimes. And the, usually the solution to burnout is to go fish or go do something else or, you know, spend some time, um, you know, doing some R and D instead of just tying the same thing over and over and over again. But, you know, I still, I still really enjoy tying. Um, I don't get uh, burnout too often. So I'm going to finish this off. And as I'm doing another part, I'll explain kind of how, um, how I kind of got into, into tying. Uh, so I'm actually going to whip finish on top of this right here. So it's important to kind of have a long whip finisher where you don't tangle up this other material where it can go through that loop okay, or just do it with your hands. Um, I have never been super quick about doing it with my, my hands, so I do it this way. Um, we're going to fold all this back now. That's where this hollow tying tool would come in handy if I knew where I threw it. I'm going to pull all this stuff back. And if you've watched the video, you kind of know it's coming next. Uh, there's a guy named Andreas Anderson out of Sweden, I believe, who I learned this trick from. And basically what we're doing is using some UV resin going all the way around like that. Let that soak in a little bit. And then we're going to push it forward to kind of balloon it out. Hit it with the light. And then that will stay in the exact right shape that it should be it's a little bit off camera just notice that let me see if i can remedy that for us there we go sorry about that so uh to answer your next question why i kind of so i'm using i'm going to use a little like pet comb here and just comb out all these tangles um, that's an important part of this so i started tying um i was probably about 15 or so uh i got a 
Uh, I actually got two Cabela's tying kits at once, uh, one from my grandparents and one from my aunt and uncle for Christmas that year. Um, so I got, you know, started a, the same way a lot of people get started with those kits. And, you know, if you're familiar with those, they don't necessarily come with the best tools and materials. And they come with that one Jack Dennis book that like everybody has. Um, that's like the manual for Western fly tying or whatever it's called. I still have it. Um, He's got a part one and two. I don't know which one I have, but I just remember like one of the first flies he wants to want you to learn how to tie is a humpy. And I still (laughs) can't try a very good humpy like really quickly. Like it took me a long time. What? That's a tough fly. Yeah, that's it's a really tough fly. Um, So I got pretty discouraged pretty quickly and didn't uh, didn't do a whole lot of it. I still remember tying like. You know, even then, like trying to tie like parachute hoppers and stuff out of uh, I didn't have any parachute posts. So I used a bucktail as the parachute post. And of course, it looked terrible. But I just I remember the first fish I caught, um, you know, fishing one of the mountain creeks up by our cabin, just casting this terrible looking parachute hopper down there that didn't look anything like a grasshopper. And the first fish just ate it with gusto because i've never seen you know it's probably starving in that little culvert pool where it was it would eat anything you threw in there um anyway that's that's kind of how i got started tying i i kind of left it for a while while i was in college um and then came back to it when i moved to austin back in uh 2008 and picked it way back up um and have been tying really since then um so you see, we brushed it out now. We got that good bait fish shape. Um, move it a little forward a little bit. Uh, so really, all that's left is we're going to add some eyes to it here. I just use on these. I use just Loctite. I really like Loctite gel glue. Um, so any kind of gel super glue works really well. So what I'm going to do is put a little dollop there in the middle. You kind of spread that around with the tip and set it kind of right where I want it. And this stuff cures with lack of oxygen. So if you put a shit in there pretty hard, right where you want it to be, it'll stick there pretty good. And I'm going to, I'm using kind of some oversized eyes on this one just to give mostly predator fish. You wanna, they're typically going to use the eyes for a target. So we want to give them a good target to look at. Same thing on this other side, but what I do to make sure, oh, that's what happens when you don't push hard enough. I got one side on there. Let me come in and put this other side on here. If you don't like gel super glue, um, the other stuff you could use is like uh, liquid fusion is like a fabric glue and works pretty well. Um, There's a lot of different glues. I would just recommend not using something that's really thin um really thin glue like will seep into this material just way too quickly um and you just don't have enough uh working time so i'm squeezing these on there pretty hard um you can you can actually feel the reaction happen like you'll feel it heat up between your fingers and that's when you know usually it's pretty good to go um so really all that's left to do is we'll add some we'll just give it a bunch of dots Make it look somewhat like a fresh stalker. Have you tried uh, E6000? E6000 works really well. Um, it, the drying time is a little bit long for my taste because uh, I want these, I typically want these to dry pretty good and pretty quickly. Um, so sometimes it just takes a little while for it to dry up, but that's uh, the, uh, the fly. Um, kind of what we're looking at added some spots to it uh you know you can go crazy with some other marker work and stuff like that if you want to and usually what i'll do too is come in with some uv resin and kind of glue these eyes on uh over the glue with some uv resin just to give it a little bit more durability um but yeah that's that's the fly for whatever reason these eyes really don't want to stay on here uh, i wonder if my glue's bad I'll fix that later. <laughs> I'll take this second to pitch Charlie Craven's basic fly tying instead of Jack Dennis's book. 
Yeah, you know, I actually bought that book from you guys when Amanda and I were on our honeymoon up there. So That's back awesome. in 2010. And if I had had that book, you see both my eyes fell off here. I'm not really, not really sure why, but we're going to try it again. Um, you know, if I would have had that book when I first started tying flies, I would have gotten better so much quicker. Um, so yeah, big, big shout out to that book. Yeah. I don't have my liquid fusion at my desk, so it's going to have to wait till later. Um, also another question from Brian. Um, he asked, how would you, how would love to know how you became a commercial tire, how, and how to, how it became a full-time gig. There we go. Sure, talk. I can answer that. Why? Uh, I'll show you one more thing about this fly. Um, and then while I'm packing up and get the stuff out for the next one, I'll answer that. So don't be afraid to experiment. So this is like the same kind of design, but just on an articulated hook with some feathers kind of thrown in. Um, instead of using craft fur for this, I'm using a material called uh, Snow Runner or also called Nyat, N-Y-A-T. Uh, it's, a, it's a natural material. Um, so threw a couple of feathers in there too. So uh, you can do that kind of technique with a lot of different flies. Do you need a snow runner dealer to find that? Uh, yes, kind <laughs> of. It's a, uh, it can be, it can be a challenge to find. I think um, there's yeah. a few dealers in the States. It's hard to find though. Yeah. There's a, there's a shop up in like Canada. I know about that used to carry it. I don't know if they still do. My, the guy I get it from is in Poland. Like he's the one who supplies everybody else. So I have to buy it. It's like a rug size every time that I buy some from him. Um, and he ships it over in a giant like burlap bag. That's um, awesome. <laughs> and like, you know, I, when I, when my UPS store gets it, they're like, what is in here? And I'm like, you know, don't worry, just animal parts. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's uh, it can be pretty difficult to find, but it's, it's worth trying to hunt some out. It has some really cool properties it's like a natural version of craft fur is the closest thing that i've been able to kind of equate it to so we'll do one more um we'll do the lunchtime jig next um, which is the bigger brother of the lunch money that i kind of designed for fishing uh, more jiggy style streamers um and i promise i will answer your question about commercial tying too while i start this uh, so this is an Umqua 506, uh, so 60 degree jig hook. This is a size one. And I'm going to add some medium lead eyes onto that. So while I'm adding these, um, so I worked at a local fly shop here, uh, Living Waters Fly Fishing from 2010 to 2015, I think. Um, so that's kind of how I got into the the fly world, um, you know, it started teaching classes and tying some custom orders and stuff up there. And, um, you know, even started tying for some other shops, uh, while I was there and it kind of grew into a big enough thing where I just decided to kind of branch out on my own. Um, you know, I had a pretty established client base already just from the shops that I've are from the customers and shops that I tied for, uh, through there. So, um, really didn't take me very long to kind of build a, a pretty established, uh, network of people I was tying for and, you know, just like starting anything else, it's kind of scary. And, you know, you're doing, uh, then it's not wanting to focus on that. Let me see if I can fix that real quick. It's focus on the last one either. Let's see. One moment. No, oh, no, almost. There it better. is. Yeah, that nice. looks better. I have the autofocus turned off on my webcam so it won't like go back and forth, but didn't realize it wasn't. Hopefully that last one wasn't too out of focus. Didn't even look at it really. Anyway, uh, so that's kind of how I got started tying commercially. And, you know, I got involved with Umqua before then, uh, sending them the lunch money. Um, so that definitely helped, um, you know, get my name kind of out there in terms of who was familiar with my flies. So anyway, for the lunchtime jig, um, just a little different version of the, the, uh, the lunch money. Tied the same way with the tail. Uh, so we just... 
added a added a little tail section back there, a little bit longer than the hook shank itself. Tie that guy in, and then this is where we'll start to to deviate a little bit. So. I kind of think of this as more of like a jigging pattern. Um, if you're familiar with different streamer types, um, kind of a jigging pattern in terms of like how you're going to fish it. Uh, if you want information on that, I would definitely recommend looking into like Kelly Gallup's books uh, on streamer fishing, modern or like uh, trophy trout on, or modern streamers for trophy trout, I think is the name of the book, something like that. There's two of them. The second one just came out last year. They're both really, really good. So we're going to add a set of legs to the back here, like that. This is kind of a crawfish color uh, that I tie. So we're going to tie in some cactus chenille. This is just a uh, size small cactus chenille in its hand. I tied this fly up there on one of the demos I did, but maybe the last time it was up there, I can't remember. So some of you may have seen it before uh, and then come in and tie a little bit of get one kind of slop and feather or uh, strung hackle feather. This is just a crawfish orange kind of grizzly feather. We want something that's just kind of webby. Um, and on these, you know, they, they varied pretty drastically in the barb size so i'm going to get down to kind of where i want it and tie it in there like so we'll wrap this guy up get it over that thread bump there we go wrap this guy up to the lead eyes there That piece off, cut that out, and just like like a woolly bugger, you're gonna just palmer this stuff up. Uh, try and keep it kind of facing towards the the rear of the hook. Like that. We're going to move, we're going to tie in, first, before we move that back, we're going to tie in some, just some polar chenille, just for some added flash. And you can do this, you can do this, so you can do the feather part as a collar on the front, or you can kind of palmer it up like I did there. I threw it a bunch of different ways. Um, I don't think it makes a huge difference either way. Let's give that maybe three or so wraps. That guy off. And then move this zonker piece over to the top. Again, separate your hair from your hide and tie that down. You can do your little bob and flick trick there. Tie that guy off. So now I'll come back in and to cut these legs to be same length as the end of the zonker. Gonna come in here, I had more legs. Uh, and I usually do a different color at the front uh, and usually do three sets at the front just to give it some more motion. So these are these uh, fusion legs from a uh, hairline. They're like copper foil on one side and like red foil on the other. They're pretty cool. Um, just adds a little bit of flash to this. Come in at the midpoint here, stretch those to the other side. And then these front ones I cut a little bit shorter, something like that. And then the whole front of the fly, I actually use these uh, foxy brushes from EP um, just to build up the front and this isn't you know these these foxy brushes are stupid expensive uh 
so you can try and you know make your own with dubbing loops and stuff like that but um you know they're expensive because they work really well i guess um so you can you can do a variety of different things to the front, but this foxy brush, you know, I've dubbed them, but this foxy brush just looks really good, I think. So I'll come in and tie that in and go all the way up to the front. And this is the short version of the foxy brush. It's like the inch and a half, I think. And then the long one is the the uh it's like three inches maybe or three and a half. I can't remember. Um, so for the size one and two, I use the the short version. And then when I get up above like a one to a one odd up to a four odd, I'll use the bigger brush um, just because it's, it's pretty significantly bigger as you're wrapping it and doesn't look quite right on a smaller hook. These have a metal core. So um, always a good idea to nip those with uh, some fingernail clippers. I'm hoping mine are right here. Otherwise I'm just gonna have you done any of your own dubbing brush building on like those dubbing brush tables? Yes. I just had a guy um, build me a really nice motorized version uh, that has like a, like a power knob and plugs in and everything like that. So there it's pretty rad. That's awesome. Um, uh, I see somebody's asking why I'm using a jig hook for this. So it, the i like tying this in bigger sizes than your standard lunch money usually so this is a size one um and you can vary the weight with a jig hook much easier so if i want to tie like a lighter version on it's still on a big hook i can do that and know that with the jig hook it's still going to ride upright in the water um so you know if i don't if i want to have something you know this time of year fishing uh bass up really shallow if i want to have something similar to like a jig that you would flip a uh, conventional style um you know uh you can weight this with uh just some let some uh, bead chain eyes instead so it'll sink really slowly as opposed to these lead eyes but it'll still ride hook up because of how this uh jig hook is designed hope that answers your question so we're going to whip finish this here. We'll add some uh, resin to the thread head. With the light and then just like with the lunch money come in. Um, you can use a regular brush. I really like this like hairline has these like I don't know when they came out, but it's like an EP brush kind of like Puglisi sells these too. They're like mini metal brushes and they work really well for this kind of thing where you're just trying to free these trap fibers. They pull out a little bit too much dubbing for my liking on the like lunch money, um, but they're really good for freeing kind of these trap fibers. So um, anyway, that's, that's kind of the lunchtime jig. I fish that a lot. Uh, for bass and redfish and stuff down here uh, works pretty well for that kind of thing so um what's the uv glue i'm using this is just the this is the loon flow it's like the same viscosity as water so it's real thin um works really well uh for using as as a head cement substitute there's a lot of other kinds uh solar easy and stuff like that that also work really well too so um you know I don't know what you guys carry at the shop, but I'm sure you guys have something pretty similar. Yeah, we have all the loon stuff, the flow, right thin, thick. Yeah, I like the loon stuff, especially the real thin stuff is what I use the yeah. most. Uh, so that's that fly. So that's that's all I had, really. Uh, happy to answer any any other questions you guys have. Um, thanks for coming and hanging out. Yeah, thanks, Appreciate everyone. It. Yeah, appreciate you guys having me on. Hope to see you guys maybe in the fall when I swing up there. Absolutely. Thanks right. again, Matt. We really appreciate you taking the time. Sure. Um, yeah. So if anyone has any other questions, now's the time. Otherwise, just shoot us a call at the shop. Um, we can help you out. Yeah, you can find me too. Yeah. Um, and shoot me a message on Instagram. I'm at Flygeek Matt on Instagram. 
my website is flygeek.net. If you're, uh, if you're looking to get some flies tied, happy to tie you some flies. Um, but appreciate you guys coming to hanging out. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you everyone who came and checked us out today. Um, here, I'm going to transition here. And, uh, again, thanks to Matt for, uh, hanging out with us and tying some great bugs. Um, again, that's flygeek.net for his website. Um, and tomorrow we have our live um, Euronymphing clinic where I'll try and teach you some Euronymphing techniques and see if we can catch a fish. If not, well, that's all right. And then we got our giveaway drawings that we typically do for our spring event. And that'll be at 3. You do not have to be present or watching to win. We'll give you a phone call or an email let you know you've won. Um, and thanks, everyone. And again, thanks, Matt. And um, we're going to sign off here. So you all have a great night. Take care. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you.